So I was praying before a little bit about this talk and, and kind of what it was going to look like. And, and I just found myself with kind of this image that I, I need your help with a little bit. But it was this image of you, each of you, right? Each of you is standing and in front of you was this kind of this mass group, right, of, of things that are vying for your attention. Things that are trying to distract you, things that you need to be responsible for. So what would be some of those things in your guys' life that, that vie for your attention? This makes our life kind of crazy at times. What would some of those things be? Fix the roof. To fix the roof. All right, stand up. Father, you're over here. You're, you know, stand over here. You're a roof. Let's just real quick see how you're doing. Dude, you've got a future. All right? All right, what are some other things? Some other things vying for your attention. People pleasing. People pleasing? Stand up. Go up there front. There you go. Multiple masses in a day. M multiple masses in a day, Chris. You've got a lot to do here. Go ahead. What's that? Studies? Yeah. You expect a seminarian to say that. All right. Great. Emails. Emails. Come on up. Yeah. Visiting the sick. Visiting the sick. Okay. Calendar? Just your general calendar? Go ahead. What else? Administrative work. Administrative work. Okay, buying for your attention. All right. What else? Hmm? My family. Your family. Great. Go for it. So all of these things are vying for our attention. Anything else? Could I just maybe throw out one? Yeah, Frank, I, though, I'm just not sure we're ready for that shirt, but... Okay, what do you think? Classes in school. Classes in school. I, I know I'm going to regret this, but go on up. <laughs> uh, maybe a couple that, that haven't been mentioned. Um, God? Yeah. Okay, let's, yeah, let's just throw him up there. Who wants to be him? <laughs> Ed, come on, you're close. Enjoy it, right? Oh, yeah. Actually, why don't you go up a step or two? Just so we, uh, <laughs> there we go. There we go, right? Huh? Sulking? Sulking. Sulking. You're right. I'm not going to. All right, these are all things that read are vying for our attention, right? We take a look at our life and our work and our ministry. And so this image when I was praying was, was this, right? And all of this, and it's not just this. It's your parish council. It's your women's group. It's the youth group. It's the geriatric group. It's, it's finances. It's budgets. It's, it's all of this. All of this stuff. And, and, and God is one of them, right? So in this image that I had about praying was this, this almost this frantic nature. And people were there like, they were just moving. We've got to do it with this. Okay, got this. And then we've got to do it with this and got this. And then every now and then we'd go and just spend a minute or two with that just to kind of make sure we got things in order. But all of these things, right? No, seriously. It has, the reality is, is if we're honest, isn't God a part of all of the things that we have to do? But brothers, I suggest that the Lord Jesus needs to be more than just a part. He needs to be the center and the focus of what we do. Amen? Amen? So this image I have of us running around frantically trying to deal with all each one of these, and I said, Jesus, what's the solution to this? And I had this exact same image. The only difference was one change. Ed, you want to come up here for a second? And Ed, enjoy this. The, the only difference between these two visions was the second one, uh, Ed, was standing between us. And, and in the first image, there was just this franticness of, of trying to deal with this and then that and that. But the second one, when the Lord was in the center, right, when he was the foe, when he was the lens which, which we were look, viewing everything else, there was, this, there was this peace, right, brothers? There was this peace that we experienced that there wasn't any one of these things that was overwhelming. There was no longer this, this mad dash to be able to deal with those, but that Jesus becomes the focus, of everything that we're doing. He becomes the lens with which we do everything. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, brothers, have a seat. Thank you. <laughs> brothers, I suggest that our relationship with Jesus must move from being one of the many things that need to be done to the one thing that needs to be done. It is the only way that we're going to be able to experience any sense of peace, any sense of order, in any sense of unity of heart.
I found it interesting that the songs that they chose this evening, because they, they both deal with this sense of, of our heart being broken. I mean, we've, talking, we've spoken this weekend about a unity, a unity in the church, a unity in cultures, a unity in, in catechesis and evangelization, a unity in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all of these things are great, but all of this, this desire for unity so far has been this external unity that we're looking for. But what we're going to talk about tonight is, is what does it look like for a unity of heart? Because, brothers, I think so oftentimes our heart is divided by all of those things that need to be done. And we get torn and we get frantic and we have to look at this and this and this. And I suggest that the only way that we're going to have a sense of unity, a sense of peace, a sense of presence in our life is when Jesus becomes the, cent the profound center of our life and that everything else is on the other side of that. That he's not just one of many things that needs to be done, but everything that needs to be done needs to be done in and through him. And I suggest, brothers that our heart will become schizophrenic until that happens. That we will be overwhelmed with ministry. We will be overwhelmed with what has to be done. We need, will be overwhelmed with the tasks at hand before us. And we're going to talk about what that causes us to do, what that looks like. But there are so many distractions, and, and, and we can... I, I think I've got the attention span of a gnat that's not ADD. I mean, I can find... Just, I can do anything other than what has to be done, right? It doesn't matter. I can, be, I can sit down and I can do my best to, to be working on a talk or working on a homily or answering emails. It's just, but I can find, YouTube can waste your life like 90 seconds at a time, right? Or, or a football game or a baseball, anything, anything. I mean, I'll watch Fixer Upper, all right? How pathetic have I become, Right? <laughs> Seriously, Chip and Joe and Gang. I mean, I know these people. This is pathetic, all right? I wanted to be intimate, but I didn't want to be that vulnerable, all right? I think I just crossed a line. But the reality, huh? The reality is that our life gets profoundly busy. And there's no way to escape this, these distractions. The Holy Father says in his most recent apostolic exhortation, he says, the presence of constantly new gadgets, the excitement of travel, and an endless array of consumer goods at times leaves no room for God's voice to be heard. We are overwhelmed by words, by superficial pleasures, by an increasing din filled not with joy, but rather with the discontent of those whose lives are losing their meaning. How can we fail to realize the need to stop this rat race? and to recover the personal space needed to carry a heartfelt dialogue with God. Finding that space may prove to be painful, but it is always fruitful. Sooner or later, we have to face our true selves and let the Lord enter. This may not happen unless we see ourselves staring into the abyss of frightful temptations or have the dizzying sensation of standing on the precipice of utter despair and find ourselves completely alone and abandoned. In such situations, we find the deepest motivation for living fully our commitment to our work and ministry. The same distractions that are omnipresent in today's world also make us tend to absolutize our free time so that we can give ourselves completely to the devices that provide us with entertainment or ferial pleasure. He goes on just on a side note, I think it was beautiful. He says, we need to distinguish between the kind of superficial entertainment and a healthy culture of leisure, which opens us to others and to reality itself is a spirit of openness and contemplation. The Holy Father is saying that we live in a world that's become so distracted. And, and I've wrestled myself with, with this balance that takes place of, of having my tablet with me when I pray because I like to be able to take notes and I like to be able to write things down. But what it becomes for me is it becomes this distraction, almost this connection to this world out there that I want to try to escape. So, so to, to be able to leave my phone away, to be able to leave my tablet, and actually there's stuff that you can buy. It's paper and you can actually write on that. It's remarkable how this works, huh? But, but this sense of, uh, of being coming detached from the world that becomes our distractions. Distractions are a reality of life. Father uh, Nathan was talking about Father Augustine Dunnigan. And he was speaking specifically about prayer, and I was talking about how I was finding myself just so distracted in prayer, and I was trying to be quiet and still, and, and all of these distractions. And he said, Dave, do you want to get distractions out of your life? I said, I do. He goes, I'm going to tell you how to do that. I said, okay, how do you do it? He said, quit praying, and you'll never have another distraction. 
that's not exactly what I was looking for, right? <laughs> but then he went on to share that he says that, that if we actually allow the distractions to Lord, to, for allow the Lord to be able to work in our distractions, we in fact might discover something about ourselves and about God that we weren't aware of. What is it that distracts us? Why is it that we worry? Why is it that we're anxious? Why is it that we feel harried? I mean, all of these distractions, the Lord, in fact, wants to be able to show us and speak to himself. The world has a way of distracting us. And what we need to be able to see is all of these distractions, what they're trying to do is they're trying to stop our focus. Just a definition. That whatever is distracting causes us to turn from what is more important to what is less important. And all of those things that I talk, all of those things that we talked about, those are important. I mean, the reality is, if you don't fix the roof, you're going to be in trouble. So it's not like these things don't matter. But the question we have to ask ourselves is in the context of what? The greater good, the greater desire, the greater brothers is to be in relationship with Jesus. And no matter what we do, that we look at it through that lens. And if we're able to look at it through that lens, they're not just distractions. Perhaps they're opportunities. Perhaps they're moments of grace. Perhaps they're moments of conversion. Perhaps they're moments of evangelization. Not necessarily on our terms or the way we want it, but rather what God wants to be able to do. But my problem, my concern, brothers, is, is that we have so many distractions that our heart is, is in way, many ways it's fractured and, and there's not a sense of peace in our heart and there's not a sense of solitude and quiet and stillness. How can we speak of, of a sense of unity out here if we're not even having a unity of heart? How is it that we can speak of unity in the church and, and unity with our Protestant brothers and sisters if I can't even find my heart to be united because it's distracted by so many things and because it's divided by so many things? In 1 Samuel 7.3, it says, When Samuel addressed the whole house of Israel, if you would return to the Lord with your whole heart, remove your foreign gods and fix your heart on the Lord and serve him, a Lord, and serve him alone. And the Lord will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. Just this sense of being able to go to the Lord with our whole heart. The shame of that we love the Lord our God with all of our heart. What would it look like? How would our life look different? How would our ministry look different if I loved God with all of my heart, with radically just the self-empty of my heart? And Lord, I want to love you, and I want to love the brothers and the presbyterate and my brother deacons. I want to love you with all of my heart. How would that look different? How would we speak differently? How would we behave differently? How would we act differently if we were actually able to do, as Samuel talked about, being able to give the Lord and love the Lord with all of our heart? Not just parts of it. What does it look like to have a divided heart? We take a look at the scriptures. I think of Peter. As we know that Jesus says, uh, who do they say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ. You're the Christ. And then Jesus goes on to say, and the Son of God is going to suffer and die. And Peter's like, no, 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 no. Not that, Lord. This first part was great. Peter had a divided heart. At the Last Supper, he just says to Peter, you will deny me. Not I, Lord, I will never deny you. I will never deny you. I, I don't even know the man. Peter has a divided heart. Luke 9, 59. And another said, follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me first bury my father. And he answered, let the dead bury their dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. To another he said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me say farewell to my family. Jesus said, no one who sets a hand to the plow and looks what was left behind is fit for the kingdom of, of God. Brothers, what do we make more important to God? I mean, what do we make more important than when it's time to pray or it's time to spend time with the Lord or it's time to try to be intimate with the Lord? We say, well, I need to get this taken care of first. I need, I'm going to answer just a few emails and then I'm going to spend some time with you, Lord. And a few emails turns into five emails, turns into a phone call, turns into checking the scores, turns into, ah, I'm exhausted. I'll, I'll pray, I'll take a few minutes before I go to bed, right? It's a divided heart. Take a look at Mark. Mark 10, I think it's one of the saddest scriptures in all the Gospels. We know the story. 
He was setting out on a journey, and the man ran up and knelt before him, and he asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answered him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. I think it's important that we, we begin this text that, that this person had a heart for God. I, I mean, he did, that, that, that he wanted to love the Lord. He wanted to inherit eternal life. It was as important, so important that he was willing to run up to Jesus. Jesus is leaving Jericho, and he's like, just before you leave, because the scripture says he's leaving, just before you leave, there's one question, and I, I really need the answer to this. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life, Right? Brothers, I'm going to assume that each one of us has answered that question, that we know what the Lord is asking me to inherit eternal life. So he runs up and he says, Jesus, what do I have to do? Jesus says, okay, you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud on your father and mother. He goes, and this teacher, all of these I observed since my youth. Jesus looking at him with love, and he says to him, you are lacking one thing. Go sell what you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. And I think this is terribly sad. At that, his statement fell, statement, his face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. This was a young man who had a divided heart. I mean, we can just close our eyes and we can see that, right? Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That, that I, I've listened to you, I've heard you, I find what you're saying attractive, there's something about it that's, uh, that I just want to be with you and near you. What do I have to do? Give up everything you have, right? Give up this, follow me. That's, that's all you have to do. It seems to me, brothers, that this is the definition of a divided heart. I mean, on one hand, don't, don't we all want to love the Lord, right? Don't we all want to be faithful to him? Don't we all? Yes, so, so let's, not, let's not just bang ourselves. It's like, oh, I'm not faithful. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a divided heart. I'm talking about at times our heart is, is richly going after the Lord and trying to seek him and be faithful in, in all the things that we're supposed to do. But brothers, we need to honestly take a look at the other times that's not. What is our riches? What is the thing that we say, I can't follow you. What is it that causes us to walk away sad? What is it that the Lord is asking of us? And brothers, if we don't know the answer to that question, we need to figure it out. We need to figure it out because my suggestion is, is that every one of us, to some degree or another, has a divided heart. It may not be things. It may not be stuff. But what is it that keeps us from profoundly following Jesus, the making him constantly the center of our life, to looking at everything else that we do in our life through the lens of Jesus, and what does it mean to my relationship with Jesus? If you're not able to write it on a piece of paper right now what that is, what is that, that thing that divides your heart, my prayer, brothers, is by the end of our time of adoration that you understand more richly what that is. Because we cannot, as we hear in the scriptures, serve two masters. Because, as we hear in the scriptures, a house divided against itself will fall. And, and if our heart is divided in times of difficulty, and in times of struggle, in times of brokenness, uh, brothers, we won't have the capacity to remain faithful. Amen? What does a divided heart look like in us? I'm just going to throw out some things for a reflection. Uh, it is, we are unstable. A man with a divided heart is inconsistent. He moves with the wind. Whatever the wind is blowing, wherever the wind seems to be blowing, that that is where our heart is. I've worked with people before. I remember one guy I worked with. The, the decision that he made was always the last person who talked to him. That was what he, how he made decisions. Whoever kind of got to him last, that was what he went with. There was no sense of conviction to him. There was no sense of firmness. If we have a divided heart, brothers, we are consumed with what other people think about us. Those of you who are seminarians, if you don't want people to talk behind your back, don't get ordained. <laughs> Amen? Brothers, they're going to talk behind your back all the time. And the line starts oftentimes with our brother priests. I need to tell you a story about him later. All right. If, if we are consumed with what other people think about us, don't get ordained. Because the reality is it doesn't matter what you do, there will be some people who love you, and some people who don't. 
And the man who has a divided heart is, is being consumed by what other people think or what by other people say. And, and if, that's what we, is that, if that's what's operating or how we work, then any decisions we make in the parish is just we make a decision on whoever yells the loudest. Whoever makes the most, there's no sense of firmness or conviction. I love what Mary was saying this morning, that when Jesus, there was no budging Jesus. He knew where he stood, and that was going to be it. Paul says, make your yes, yes, and your no, no. But the man with the divided heart, whose heart is divided because he's so concerned about what other people think. The reality is, as brothers, our life of ministry is lived out there, and people get to shoot at us, and shoot they will. And shoot, they will. And, and the problem oftentimes, brothers, is we give them the arrow. We give them the arrow and the ammunition to shoot against us. Brothers, we need to be able to have a firm heart in the Lord and not provide the world and not provide anyone an ability to be able to shoot at us that it affects us or it frightens us or we merely do and say things because we're afraid of what somebody else is going to say. A man with a divided heart is consumed by what other people think. There is a lack of confidence in him. They are swayed by threats. They are swayed by flattery. They are swayed by detraction. They're not walking in the authority of who they, am, who they are. A man with a divided heart is frustrated, is short-tempered, is impatient, is belittling, is selfish, is insecure. A demand with a divided heart is motivated by pleasure, by comfort, by entertainment, by food. A man with a divided heart is unable to deny himself. For the part of his heart which desires and longs and lusts and, and, and is gluttonous is what ultimately makes the decisions for him. A man with an undivided heart is unhappy won't commit to anything, is ambivalent. A man with an unclean heart or an, un, an undivided heart or a divided heart is unclear of his identity. And as such, his heart is divided. So we can't fully stand in who the Lord has asked us to be and who he's called us to be because we don't even know exactly who we are. And that's what Mary was sharing this morning, is that Jesus knew who he was, and, and there was no division in his heart. He knew what his identity was, that he was the son of God, and brothers, that this needs to be same our reality, that, that we need to come to the place that we really don't care what other people think. And the reality is, as ministers of the gospel, people are going to think and say some horrible things. Do this for, give, give your parish and your community an opportunity to review your, God, your homilies online. Do that do that. I had an opportunity recently, somebody shared me a link of, of what somebody said about one of the ep most of the episodes of The Wild Goose. Let's just suffice it to say they don't like me at all, right? They don't like me at all. And they think the whole thing is, I mean, I would love to say that none of that ever bothers me, but the reality is, is, is that that is not what defines me. What other people say about me and what other people think about me and what other people write, and come, none of that defines me, brothers. I am a son of God and that is what defines me and that's what I find my identity in. And what all the people, the bickering and all of that crap just doesn't matter. And I think that that's what Jesus was fully able to do. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. It, this is how much it didn't matter to him, right? You can do whatever you want. It's not going to change who he is and what he believes to be true, and what he knows of himself, and what he knows of his father. And brothers, that is a man with a heart singly devoted to God. Amen? Amen. And I suggest that that's what happens and begins to happen to us when our heart is singly focused. And we don't have a divided heart. That I know who I am. And it doesn't matter what the world says. The world will try, as Benedict says, to try to sell us comfort, right? But that's not what we were made for. Rather, we're made for greatness. What causes a divided heart? Suffering. Brokenness. Loss. The number of people who have said to me over the years, I didn't think it was going to be so hard. And, and, and what this does is it causes us to begin to question. Am I positive? Is it worth it? Yeah, tragically, um, about 18 months, two years ago, uh, I was dealing with a priest in, somewhere in the Midwest, and 
he was just experiencing great difficulty and struggle in his parish. And the issue was the, the whole issue of, of whether or not the Mass was going to be done in Latin or whether or not it was going to be done in English. And there was this group that was, uh, I won't say it doesn't matter what side, but was just much more vocal. And, and, and he said he just feels like he's just being torn apart. And he said to me, I didn't know if it was going to be so hard. And, and I just don't know if it's worth it anymore. I don't know if it's making any difference. And, and you could literally see his heart being torn open. Pain. Betrayal, right? Betrayal. Uh, b betrayal by our brothers. By the very men that, that, that we, we hope are going to have our back are oftentimes the ones who betray us. Which begins to divide and, and to literally break our heart. Jealousy. Disappointment. One of the things that causes us an inability to, uh, that causes a divided heart is an inability to trust God. And if I don't trust God, how can I be single-hearted for him? Fear. We hide. We become paralyzed. What else divides our heart? Unholy attachments. Those things that we attach ourselves to. Sometimes there are things, Right? Sometimes there are things, those, imagine those things that are precious to you being taken away, being freed from that so that your heart can be free from it. About three years ago, I got a call, well, two or three calls from my dad. My dad doesn't call a lot, he usually texts, and I got a call, I was in a meeting, I couldn't answer. My dad called like three times in about an hour. I knew something was up. So I got on, I called him back, I said, Dad, what's up? He goes, I haven't even talked to your mom yet. Now this, this may not seem like a big deal to you, right? But through, through a series of mistakes that this company had made, my dad had gone to the, the storage shed that they had, and they had gotten rid of all of the contents of that storage shed. The company had sold it all. But why it was so difficult, it was all of their Christmas decorations. And it was 50 years of Christmas decorations, and my particular family tree is the ugliest Christmas tree you could ever imagine in the world, because everything on that tree was made by me and my brothers and sisters. And it was pathetically ugly, right? <laughs> Seriously, we had this thing of popcorn that we had. My brother did this purple. Well, it was supposed to be a teddy bear, and it was just purple, right? It was just it was, and and the top of their star was was the star that they got on the day uh, on their first Christmas together. It cost twenty five cents, and it's all they could afford. And he said they're all gone. The people said that I hadn't paid the bill, and they sold everything. She goes. Dad says, I haven't even told mom yet. And mom and dad shared with me later, they said, Dave, we realize it's stuff and in, in that, in that in many ways that this has been a graced moment for us because it's caused us to be detached. Not a detachment that they would have chosen. What is it that, that we're attached to? What are these unholy attachments? And maybe it's things. My experience is things are actually pretty easy to get rid of. But it's attachments like worried about what other people think of me. It's attachments like reputation. I love what Sister Ann Shield says. She goes, the only one in the world who cares about reputation is the evil one. If you're consumed by your reputation, you have an unholy attachment. Lies. This attachment that we have towards lies, lies that we believe that we're not enough, lies that say we're not as good as, lies that say I'm not as funny as, lies that say that I'm not as holy as, whatever these lies that we find ourselves attached, and the Lord wants to be able to free those. He wants to be able to speak a word of truth to us. I think many brothers, <coughs> excuse me, have a divided heart because they can't get past the past. Right? A part of their heart is always turned towards the past. Things that you did 10, 15, 20 years ago yesterday. And there's a part of your heart that is always looking back at that. And there's this attachment that doesn't allow your heart to be singly focused on the Lord. I don't know if you saw the film of the Apostle, the Apostle of Paul, what was it called? Apostle of Christ. So it was the most recent film on, on St. Paul. One of the scenes that I thought was beautiful, and it's kind of this recurring scene, but it was 
Paul at the martyrdom of Stephen. And in these images, it just kind of flashes that go through his mind, and, and there's blood on his hands. And it's a really graphic scene. And yet, and yet you know that that's, that's something that has Paul's heart, that, that he was responsible for another man's death. And, and that's why it's, it's so profound and beautiful when Paul says that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That, that something profoundly changes in him that he can actually walk away from the things of the past. What are those things that you can't let go of? The things that cause you to question your identity. Brothers, this isn't just us figuring it out, right? It's allowing the Spirit of Jesus to reveal to us our divided, our broken, our disunited heart. But what is, it, what is a heart that is so singly focused look for? I love in Psalm 86, 11, it says, Teach me, Lord, your way, that I may walk in your truth, single-hearted in revering your name. When we take a look at the scriptures, we see some great images of men and women who are single-hearted. I love this story of the, the paralytic. And the three guys, right, they go to him and they want to bring him to Jesus. And they say, well, we'll just carry you to Jesus. And, and I hope, brothers, that, that I have friends like that, right? I hope that I've got friends that are going to pick me up and they're going to take me to Jesus. I mean, those are brothers and those are friends. But when they get there, we know the story, right? There's this crowd there. So that's not going to deter them. These men are single-hearted. They're single-focused on this brother is going to get to Jesus. So we know the story. They say, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take you on the roof and we're going to dig a, a little hole. That whatever it is that's going to keep us away from Jesus, we're going to break through that. Now, <coughs> excuse me, if I was the paralytic, I'd probably say, you know something, why don't we just sit with this for a second, all right? I don't think we need to go this route. Let's just sit. He's going to eventually come out, you know? Let's just wait. I'm not going anywhere, right? Seriously, just send me down. I'm not going anywhere. But no, it's like we are going to take you and we are going to put you in front of Jesus. They dig this hole and they put him in the salvation, brothers. Salvation comes to that man because he had three brothers, four brothers, however many there were. They were single-hearted on getting him to Jesus. I want two things in my life. A, I want a friend like that. I want a brother like that that's going to bust his ass to make sure that I get to Jesus. No matter what it takes, he's going to see that I get to Jesus. Amen? And I want to be a brother like that that's going to take my brothers and, and carry them and fight for them and do whatever it takes that I'd be single-hearted to get my brother there. Or the woman with the hemorrhage. I mean, this is a woman who is single-hearted. All she wants to do is she wants to touch the hem of his garment. And she's going to do whatever. And she's, she's working her way through this crowd. And I'm sure people are like, what's your problem? There's a line here, right? Get in line. A lot of everybody here wants to see him. And she's pushing and she's shoving. Much like being at the Vatican, surrounded by nuns, right? <laughs> Am I right? Am I right? Yeah, those of you who are laughing know that you're, I'm right. Single-hearted. Zacchaeus. Short guy. And he wants to see Jesus. He wants, he's going to do whatever this takes, right? So Jesus is coming through. He goes and he climbs a tree. This guy is single hearted on seeing Jesus. And there's just this beautiful image, and I just love it, because it speaks so much about our relationship with the Lord. Uh, with all this chaos that's going on, Jesus recognizes, and he sees him up, and, and he calls out Zacchaeus. I mean, there's something just, I think, just beautiful about that, that Jesus knows his name, right? Zacchaeus, come out of the tree. God's call is always personal. It's not, hey, all of you, right? It's Zacchaeus, come out of the tree. And Zacchaeus comes down, and as we know, the crowd is beginning to talk to him. Do you know what kind of person he is? Yada, 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 yada. And he says, Zacchaeus, I want to have dinner at your house. Now, if this was my story, right, or if this was growing up, and, and the bishop was coming over to my house, mom would spend the next six hours. It's like, okay, you're welcome, but let me clean up first, right? But the Lord is not like that. He says, Zacchaeus, I know you're a mess. I know you're a mess, but I also know you want to see me. And you were going to do whatever you needed to do to be able to use Zacchaeus or single-hearted. And because of that, salvation is going to come to your house. What's it look like for you to be single-hearted? What has to change in your life? What is it that holds you back?
First time we hear of Mary Magdalene is in the eighth chapter of Luke. Afterwards, he journeyed from one town and village to another, preaching and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Accompanying him were the twelve and some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, Joanna, the wife of Herod Steward Chusa, Susanna, and many others, provided them out of their resources. I think we could probably just give a whole other talk on, on this whole theme of unity when we take a look at this group that's accompanying Jesus. There's the 12, and then there's these women. Uh, brothers, in the last many years, have been going from parish to parish and doing ministry in, in, in parishes with parish missions. Uh, I'm profoundly grateful for these women, right? These women that serve, these women that pour out their life, the women that, that, that take care of so many needs of the parish, but it's always been that way, right? With Jesus were the 12 and some women. And they walked with him. And if we take a look at these women, you've got one woman who was a Herod, one of the stewards of Herod's. So she had wealth. And then you have Mary Magdalene who had seven demons cast out of her. The diversity in this group was able to be united because they kept their eyes on Jesus. Just as a side note, we, we speak oftentimes of diversity, and diversity has such a negative connotation in so many places today, but the reality is one of the things that I love about being Catholic is our profound diversity, that we look in this group and there's a diversity in this, and I rejoice in that. And it's not something to apologize for, rather it's something to be celebrated, amen? amen. And we see that in this woman. Mary Magdalene was single-hearted. Why? Because she knew what it was that Jesus had done for her. Mary, Mary Healy was speaking either yesterday or this morning about this, this, this need that we have to be able to know what it is that Jesus has rescued us from. Mary Magdalene knew what it was that Jesus had rescued. She was possessed by seven demons. And Jesus frees her. Her heart is free. And all she wants to do is be with the Lord. And she goes with him. And she walks with him and she stays with him. The next scene that we see Mary Magdalene, there was also women looking from a distance. And among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of the younger brother of James and Joses and Solomon. These women had followed him and they were from Galilee and they ministered to him. There were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. It's in the 15th chapter of Mark and it's at the crucifixion of Jesus. Finally, in the 20th chapter of John. Just imagine the scene for a second. Have you ever anticipated something? And you kind of get nervous and, and kind of anxious about it, and, and you're looking forward to it, and what's it going to be like? And so we take a look at the 20th chapter of John, verse 11. Now we'll start at the beginning. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark. And just imagine the scene again for a moment, brothers, that, that I can only imagine Mary, she's kind of hanging out in her house, and she's nervous, and she's anxious, and she's ready to go, and she, she's just, it's like as soon as the sun rises, as soon as the sun begins to peak, then she's able to go, but the scripture says that she's walking through Jerusalem, and it's still dark. And where is she going? She's going to a place of burial, and she's doing this in the dark. This is a woman that is single-hearted. All she wants to do is to be near Jesus. That, that, that's all she wants. And, and I imagine, like, she's, she's checking her watch, and, and she's, is, is it time yet? And, and it's like she's seeing the sun, because all she wants to do is she wants to be with Jesus. This is a woman who's single-hearted. This is a woman who loved the Lord. This is a woman who wanted nothing else in her life other than to be with him. And she walks through early in the morning in the dark. She hadn't really thought this through. What is this going to look like, all right? Uh, she's going to the tomb, and the reason that she's going to the tomb is she's going to because she wants to anoint Jesus' body. Now, she hasn't really thought this through because there was a big stone that was going to be in front of it, and, and we'll worry about that later. All she wants is she wants to be with Jesus. And just for a second, you guys, imagine the scene. What her desire is is to be able to anoint the body of Jesus. So what she wants to do, and, and I think this intimate, vulnerable, beautiful 
She wants to be able to go into that place of burial and she wants to unwrap his body which had been beaten and which was bruised and which was bloody and she wanted to take those wrappings off in this cold, dead body, probably stiff by now, probably smelling a little bit and she wants to take oil and she wants to anoint his body. Just for a second, imagine this scene, all right? She taking oil and she pouring it over his feet and, and, and rubbing his feet and, and the mixture of the blood and the, it's crusted and this is what this woman wants to do. His cold, dead body to be able to anoint it with oil. I would say Mary Magdalene was single-hearted. She saw the stone removed from the tomb, so she ran away to Simon Peter and the other disciples that Jesus loved and told them, they've taken the Lord away from the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciples went out and they came to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived to the tomb first. He bent down, he saw the burial cloth there, but he didn't go in. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and he saw the burial cloth there. And the cloth that covered his head was not with the other burial cloth, but rolled up in a separate place. Then the other disciples went in and he saw and he arrived to the tomb first and he saw and he believed for they did not yet understand the scriptures that he had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned home. Now I just think this is a really interesting thing that takes place. Okay, so Jesus and Mary goes to the tomb. She runs back. She tells Peter and John. Peter and John, they run. And then the next scene we find Mary, she comes back to the tomb. Why does she go back to the tomb? She's got nowhere else to go. I mean, she's going back to the tomb, and now the tomb is empty, but imagine that she has nowhere else to go. She doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know. The only place she can think is, I, I have to go back. So she stays outside the tomb weeping. And as she went, wept, she bent down, and she looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head of the feet where, the body, where Jesus' body had been laid. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. I just think this is such a cute, cool image, right? The first thing that we hear of Mary Magdalene is that she had seven demons cast out. And this, what we hear at the end here is that she's having a conversation in the tomb with two angels. This is a woman who is single-hearted for the Lord. They have taken my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. When she said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to, him, to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? She thought it was the gardener, and she said to, sir, said to him, Sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you laid him, and I will take him. The, Mary has already, in one sense, made peace with the fact that Jesus is dead. Just... Just tell me where he is. I, I just want to be with him. She wants to be with what she understood at the time, a cold, dead body. And she'll do whatever she needs to do to be able to see that that happens. Just tell me. I haven't quite figured out this out. Like, if you tell me, in fact, where he is, I don't exactly know what I'm going to do because I'm a single woman. It's not like I'm going to be able to pick him. But I just... I just want to be with him. So tell me where he is. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus says to her, stop holding on to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. Mary went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Brothers, I suggest that Mary is a woman who is single-hearted for the Lord. And nothing was going to sustain her. Nothing was going to keep her away from the Lord. And I think that that's the same desire that the Lord has for us, to be able to allow us to recognize and to see where our heart is split. And, and at times, what becomes more important than him? What are the things that vie for our attention? What is it that divides our heart? put me together. It's this sense of, of, Lord, that my heart is so scattered and so, so broken that you need to be able to put it together. But 
how does that happen? We, we merely only need to take a look at Peter again, right? The Peter, uh, I'll follow you, Lord. I'll never wander away. I don't even know him. But there's something that takes place in Peter that, that in fact, I think, restores his heart and brings it back, and it's a Pentecost. The same Peter who denies Jesus goes to the upper room, and Jesus says, wait for the promise of the Father. And then when Jesus sends forth the Spirit on Peter, Peter comes out with a man who is now once finally single-hearted. He's actually able to be faithful to what he wanted. Like, I think Peter was honest when he said, this is what I want. This is what I long for, that I want to be able to proclaim you in the Christ. And yet, because of the fickleness of his heart, he wasn't able. But his heart did not become united. His heart did not become firm until he experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. And from there, he'll stand up in front of everybody, and he'll say, let me tell you, right? And people will say, who is this guy, right? He must be drunk. He can't be drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. Because it's impossible to be drunk at nine o'clock in the morning. Brothers, let's pray. Lord, come with your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, come with your light. Father, we come before you this evening. At times, our hearts divided. Our hearts turned away from you. And there are reasons for this, and a brokenness, a suffering, betrayal, disappointment, deceit, lies. Lord, come with your Holy Spirit. Brothers, I just invite you in a moment to ask the Lord that he would show you your heart. What is it that divides your heart? Jesus, come with your Holy Spirit. We bless you. We glorify you. Holy are you, Lord God. Jesus, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would come with your light and come with your truth. Brothers, I just, I get a sense that the Lord is inviting us to say yes to him. And, and I'm sure in one way or another, everybody here has said yes to the Lord before. But I, I think the first step of, of having, being single-hearted for the Lord is, is to say yes to the Lord again. Is to be able to say yes to his love, yes to his call, yes to his grace, yes to his healing, yes to his power. And that image I had at the beginning of, of being torn with all of these things that are vying our attention, that, that putting Jesus in the center and looking at the rest of life through that reality, that, that I look at everything through the light of Jesus. So brothers, I'm just going to make a really simple invitation. Again, I'm sure we've done it before, but I think it's just an invitation to say, yes, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life once again. I want to say yes to you. I want to commit my life to you once again. Now, there may be some of you, and it's weird to do it in a group like this, that they've never actually done that publicly. There's kind of this assumption that you've said yes to Jesus, but you've never actually stood up and said, Jesus, I want to commit my life to you. But I think the Lord wants us to do that tonight. I think he wants us to begin our time of prayer and our time of ministry and our time of healing tonight to be able to say yes to him be able to give our life to him again. So the music ministry is just going to play uh, a hymn, and I'm just going to ask you, as you feel so inclined, or if you feel the invitation tonight to commit your life once again, to put Jesus in the center of your heart, and by that saying, Lord, I want to be singly hearted for you. I want my heart to be restored and to be renewed and to be healed and to be freed tonight. If that's something you think the Lord wants to invite you to, I'm just going to invite you to stand up during this hymn. Pray for that, for that single-heartedness.